to Colossians chapter 4. We're going to be continuing there in that study of Colossians where we've been at. We'd like to welcome those of you that are joining us now live on our live stream, either on YouTube or Facebook. We're glad that you've uh, chosen to tune in with us. Um, it's It's been a week. I don't know how it's been for you, but for us, it's been a week. How many of you remember me telling you about um, a mishap with our van in October? We had a mishap with the van in October. Uh, well, in September, the head gasket on our one car went out. We had to figure out a new car situation. Then um, we got our van got hit. We hit something with our van, and it had to go into the shop. And we were without it for six weeks. I got the van back on Thursday. Friday, I'm driving home from picking Andrew up, and a deer decides to run in front of my new car. So now I'm down that car. Um, so, like, I, I don't believe that God is punishing me. I don't. But I have, that, I have that sort of, you know, tension between my emotional brain and how I feel about it and my logical brain and what I know is true. And I've been sort of in a daze, honestly, for the last few days over it. And I want to thank Dave Amaral for allowing me to borrow uh, an extra vehicle that he has so that we can continue our normal functioning of our family. I don't know how it is for you guys. But for us, if we only had one car, I don't know how we would make it work with kids needing to be at different places at the same time and you know how all that logistics goes. But anyway, I'm glad to be here. It was a little bit of a weird week. This week, obviously, is Thanksgiving week. I know a lot of you are traveling. We're traveling. Um, I'm not a superstitious pagan Gentile, but I am going to knock on wood that we're going to attempt to go to Wisconsin uh, to, to visit with my family. But I do want to share just a few things with you this morning uh, before we really get rolling. I, this card was up here. Um, I'm assuming this arrived this week because I don't remember seeing it before. But this is from uh, Darlene and Steve, and I'm going to read what I can make out on the card, okay? So, again, this is not to criticize Darlene's handwriting because mine is far worse, as my wife will attest. She, uh, it says, thank you all so much for the great send-off. We, are, we have finally left Michigan last Saturday, and am at my daughter's in Des Moines, Iowa. It says, well, I think it says, well, uh, while Steve is parked and doing some last-minute work on the RV, uh, it has been a trip, exclamation mark. Please play for Darlene, being in a confined space with Steve for a long, <laughs> a long period of time. But anyway, I digress. Steve, that was meant in jest, okay? Um, then there's some stuff here about well, their, their final destination is somewhere in, in Phoenix and in Colorado, and it, I can make out that they're going to be attending uh, Brother Rick Jr.'s church, it looks like, in, uh, in Arizona, at least for a little while. And then she says, thank you for all your prayers and support uh, over the last few years. God bless, love in Christ, Darlene and Steve Hamoki. So we want to we wanna thank them for that. Um, and then uh, this, there's some mystery intentionally about what I'm going to talk about next week. Um, next week, we're not, I'm not going to be preaching on Colossians. I'm going to be kind of addressing some thoughts that have been on my mind as a pastor for a while, um, just about the issue of, of reading the Word of God and studying the Word of God and where I think some folks are at with some of those things and just some observations. And then what, I'm going to put a challenge in front of the church regarding a Bible reading challenge for next year. Uh, for for uh, 2022 of 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 us, uh, you'll you'll have to come to hear more about it. I don't want to say more than I'm even prepared to say yet. But anyway, that's where that's at. This morning we're going to continue our study in Colossians. So I'll stop dithering and get going. Last Sunday we looked at verse four. No, I'm sorry, verse five. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Let your moderation. I'm sorry. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Lord, thanks again for this opportunity that we have to, to um, come out and study your word. Lord, we pray that as we look at this uh, passage, particularly verse 6, that we'll have clarity and understanding from your word about it. We, we're thankful for our time together this morning. We ask that it will be edifying and encouraging. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So last Sunday we looked at verse 5. Verse 5 says, Walk in wisdom toward them that are without redeeming the time. So as we come now this morning into verse 6 where it says, Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. It's important to note first that verse 6 is a continuation of the thought that began in verse 5. Okay, 
In verse 5, Paul is commanding, when he says walk, that's an imperative command there at the beginning of verse 5, walk in wisdom towards them that are without. So verse 5, Paul commanded the Colossians to walk in wisdom toward them that are without. And we, as we saw last week, that's a phrase to refer to those who are not saved, right? Those who are not in the body of Christ, those who are not a part of the local church. Now, we understand that there's the greater body of Christ of which all believers are a part of, and then there's the local assembly, right? Though that, that, that local manifestation of the greater body of Christ. So, the verse 5 is specifically about developing some wisdom in our walk towards them that are without, or towards the unsaved, and the admonition to redeem the time. And we, I talked about that, what that meant a lot last Sunday. I'm not going to rehash all of that or will not make any progress, but we talked about redeeming the time, and time, it's interesting to me that the Scripture uses that word redeeming the time because time in economics is a scarce resource. It's, a, it's something that you only have a limited amount of time in your life. You're only here for as long as you're here, and so your time is not unlimited. It, your time is not exhausted. And Paul specifically talks here in Colossians 4 and Ephesians 5 about walking and redeeming the time. In, Galatians, in Ephesians 5, he talks about not as unwise, but as wise, redeeming the time. And so we talked about that last Sunday and looked into what that might mean. Now, verse 6 is a continuation of verse 5. Verse 6 says, Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. So one of the ways one does this, one of the ways that one is going to watch uh, sh should be uh, watching and minding the way that they come across to those who are without in verse 5 is the issue of your speech in verse 6, okay? So 5 and 6 go together. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace. So as you think about walking in wisdom toward them that are without, towards the unsaved, as you think about walking in wisdom with respect to them, one of the things that comes up now in verse 6 in relationship to that is the issue of our speech and how we talk and what we have to say and how we have to say it. Verse 6, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. You know, what speaking the truth matters, but so does how you say it. Okay, Speaking the truth matters, but so does how you say it. So how we say things ought not get in the way of what we're saying. You hear what? How we say something ought not cloud or get in the way of what it is that we're saying. Now, let me just be clear about something, okay? Somebody can be the biggest jerk, the most offensive person, the uh, just obnoxious and out of control and, and all this sort of thing, but if they say a statement that is true, does the attitude that they say it with make the statement any less true? So if somebody says, Jesus Christ died on the cross for sin, was buried and rose again, and they say it like the biggest jerk and knucklehead that ever walked and existed, does the fact that they say it in a brash, harsh, unkind way cancel out the truth of what's said? No. So truth is not determined by the attitude of the person that is saying it, right? However, somebody's reception of the truth can and is impacted by the way in which we say things the manner in which we communicate things, right? Paul says to speak the truth in love, right? And we'll look at that verse a little bit later on. So as we look at the first phrase now, verse 6, he says, let your speech be always with grace, okay? Now look, I'm going to mention something here. I'm going to say just a few things about it, and I'm going to move on. I'm not going to spend the whole message talking about it, and that's the word always, okay? If you look at the verse, it says, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. The word always is an older form of the word always, okay? And they ha uh, that was sometimes retained in the King James Bible. So sometimes the, in the King James Bible, you're going to find the word always, and then you're going to find the word always. You're in the same chapter, drop down to verse, um, where, let me get it right here. You want to go to verse uh, 12, go to verse 12, same chapter, verse 12, and Jesus, uh, which is called Justice, who is of the circumcision, these only are my fellow workers unto the kingdom of God. I'm reading the wrong verse, verse 12. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you. What's the next word? Always, right? So verse 12 has always. Verse 
Six has all way. And there are many defenders of the King James who, in my opinion, to go way too far with this. And they want to say that there's somehow a discriminated difference in meaning between the word all way and the word always. Okay? And I'm going to tell you right now that I think that's superstitious. Okay? I don't think there's any truth to that. I think the reason it's that way in one verse and uh, spelled differently a little bit later on is simply because this was done in the early 17th century and there are no standard conventions, etc., about how to spell some of these words. And so, all way and always are essentially the same word. Now, can somebody, can one of you guys bring up the um, uh, tablet, please? If we look at Webster's 1828 Dictionary, Noah Webster's American Dictionary of the English Language, here's what it says for all way. All way or all ways. All way or all ways. What does that mean? It means the same thing, okay? All and way, okay? Here's, for those of you that are real nerds like me, you're going to want to look at the Oxford English Dictionary, and here's the entry for all way, and you'll see, look at number one, it, sp it explicitly says that number one for all way equals what? All ways. If you go to number two, guess what it's going to say? Definition number two for all way equals what? All ways. Definition number three for all way equals what? All ways. I mean, it's like a broken record. Two, uh, 3B, all way equals all ways. For every entry, for, the, for every meaning of the word all ways, or all way, the Oxford English Dictionary says it equals a meaning that we find where? You guys can take that down. It says it equals a meaning where? They mean the same thing. All way and all ways mean the same thing. The same Greek word that's translated in verse 6, all way, is the same word that's in verse 12 where we say it translated all ways. Okay? So the same word is rendered elsewhere in the New Testament as ever or evermore. How long is evermore? For what? Forever. If I'm going to do something all ways, how often am I going to do it? I'm going to do it all the time. If I'm going to do something all way, how often am I going to do it? I'm going to do it all ways, right? So teaching that says there's some sort of discriminated difference in meaning between these things, I don't think it's true. I wrote about this in my book, The King James Bible in America, if you want to know more about it, and also in a video that I did, The King James Bible in America, All Way and Always, a video critique where I was responding to some things that were said about my book by a different pastor, okay? So, when we look here at verse 6, it says, Your speech, let your speech be all way or always with what? So the characteristic of your speech, the characteristic of my speech, as we think about walking in wisdom towards them that are without in verse 5, the characteristic of our speech needs to be that it is always or always with what? With grace. Grace should be the characteristic of our speech. Hold your hand there and come over to Ephesians chapter 4. Now some of you need to realize that what I just said about those words is going to make a bunch of people mad. But you know what, I'm, I'm over that, okay? We need to teach things that are true, that can be proven factually, not things that are just made up and, um, because people aren't really thinking about what's going on on some of these things, okay? Look at verse 29. He says, let no corruption, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Now, stop there. That be your speech. So Colossians 4, 6 talks about let your speech be always with grace. Here in Ephesians verse, chapter 4, verse 29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. So corrupt, our communication should not be corrupt that comes out of our mouth. Notice what it says, but that which is good to the use of what? Edifying. Now watch, that it may minister what unto the hearers? See, our speech should be ministering edification and grace to the hearers. So as we think about walking in wisdom toward them that are without there in Colossians chapter 4, verse 5, one of the first ways that we demonstrate that, one of the first ways that we manifest wisdom in our walk towards them that are without is in our speech. It's in how we talk. It's in our speech being always with grace, right? Verse 29 again. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. So if you're using your mouth, if you're using the communication that comes out of your mouth, what Colossians 4, 6 calls speech, it should, be, see, it should be with grace and it should be done to the use of edifying, not tearing somebody down, not running them into the ground, not belittling them, demeaning them, 
or any of those kinds of ways that speech is often used, it should be edifying. It should be with grace. It should minister grace to the hearer. Verse 30. <coughs> and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking, there it is again, evil speaking, be put away from you with all what? Malice. And be ye kind one toward another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. So according to Paul, our apostle, our speech needs to be always with grace. And you say, well, what does that mean? What it means is the following. Is it edifying or not? If it's not edifying, if it's not building up, then it's not speech that is being spoken or communicated under the characteristic of what? Of grace. How do I know? Verse 29 says so. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying. So edifying communication, what does it do? That it may minister grace unto who? So folks, as you think about walking in wisdom toward them that are without, the first thing you've got to realize is that what you say and how you say it says a lot to that person about who and what you are. So if you are on the workplace or in your family and you're cursing like a sailor and you're telling all the dirty jokes and you're, you know, laughing with everybody else when they're, you know, talking nasty about women or about whatever it is and you're, you're, you're right along with them in that, that is not indicative of a walk that's being done in wisdom. It's not being done in wisdom toward them that are without because the speech and so forth is not ministering grace. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, uh, verse 1, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, which is idolatry, let it not once be named among you as become as saints. Verse 4, Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, notice, which are not convenient. Now, I love, that, I love that qualifier there when it says which are not convenient. So that tells me something right away. That tells me that filthiness, foolish talking, and jesting are not convenient, meaning do they have within them the potentiality to not minister grace and to edify so I know I just broke what I've, I, I know I'm, re, I'm teaching this this morning, and I'm reading and I'm making jokes about Darlene riding in the car with Steve. I said it in jest, okay? So I'm, here I am violating the verses right here. But we got to be careful about what we say, don't we? we got to be careful about how we say things. We need to be careful about who we're saying what to. You have to know the people you're around. You, have to, you can't just be a bull in a china shop and saying things to people that, that are not thought out. Verse 4, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, here it is, which are not convenient. The problem with those things is they're not convenient. There's, there's too much opportunity within them for people to misunderstand and for feelings to get hurt, and they don't edify necessarily. And so there's a caution here. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather the giving of thanks. Come with me over to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Come with me over to 2 Timothy chapter 2. <coughs> 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24, it says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be how? Gentle unto all men, apt to teach, how? Patient. So folks, if you encounter somebody who's not a believer, who doesn't understand, who isn't aware of, of, of the Word of God, isn't aware of the Scriptures, should you deal with them in a brash, harsh, nasty way, or should you deal with them in meekness, instructing those that what? Oppose themselves. Verse 24, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness. Verse 25, In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. Now, there's a 
principle of meekness there that we are to operate in towards people that are not seeing the truth the way we do, right? Who are not understanding things possibly accurately. And this is in the same context here in verse 24, 25, and 26 of rightly dividing the word of truth in the same chapter back in verse 12, right? Now, there's a way to handle these things. There's a way to deal with them in a way that, that, that seeks to minister grace to the hearer, that seeks to allow them the opportunity to recover themselves. So, yes, we have to speak the truth, but do we have to speak the truth in a, in a way that is becoming of the truth? Okay? Now, eventually, we, we're not going to look at the verses this morning, but Paul talks about what to do with people who refuse to believe the truth. He says, he that is a heretic after the first or second admonition do what? Reject. So if you talk to people and you deal with them in meekness, seeking to instruct them that oppose themselves, and they still won't change their mind, they still won't repent and change their mind about it, is it your job to continue to badger them and talk to them all the time and circle back to them every day, every time you see them and say, where are you at with this? Or is there a time where you say, I've, I've, I've told them what they need to know, I've explained it to them patiently, I've instructed them in this, and I need to now do what? Leave it alone. Okay? Let's go back to Colossians chapter 4. So we're talking here about skill. We're talking here about wisdom. Walking in wisdom toward them that are without. One of the main ways we do this is with our speech. Verse 5, Colossians 4, 5. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace. Now we have an interesting statement here. Seasoned with salt. So number one, the, the, number, the first characteristic of your speech, as you think about walking in wisdom toward them that are without, the first characteristic of your speech is that it's to be always with grace. The second characteristic of your speech is that it's to be seasoned with salt. Now, how many think that's an interesting way to say that? So what does it mean when he says that? So for our grace-motivated speech needs to secondarily be seasoned with salt, Paul says in, in verse 6. Now, it's interesting. This is the only time in Paul's epistles that he mentions the issue of salt. It's not the only time in the scriptures, obviously, that salt is mentioned. In fact, it, it's mentioned a lot in the Gospels. Let's just go look at a few things. Go back with me. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 5. I just want to look at a few occurrences of this issue of salt and look at some things that are said in relationship to it. Now, in, in our day, everyone's trying to avoid salt, right? Right? Everyone's trying to avoid salt, They'll raise your blood pressure and all this stuff, right? And low sodium, I love, whoever came with the idea of low sodium pretzels? I mean, isn't the whole idea why you have a pretzel because you want something salty? I mean, come on, man. But everybody wants to avoid salt, and now here's Paul saying that your, your speech should be seasoned with what? Seasoned with salt, right? And by the way, this whole thing about avoiding salt is only a modern deal, because for most of world history, if you didn't have salt, you couldn't preserve your food, all right? And if you didn't have salt to preserve your food, go study world history and look at the kingdom of the Tuareg in northern Africa who got rich off the salt trade, selling salt to everybody in Europe and in the Middle East because they needed the salt to preserve their food, okay? So salt, historically, has been worth a lot of money. People who controlled salt had power. And they, they had the ability to, you know, get rich, et cetera, off of this, right? And it wasn't until the invention of smoking first, and I don't mean smoking, I mean smoking your food, preserving it through smoking it, and then later on refrigeration, et cetera, salt up to that point was a big deal. You had to have salt to preserve your food. And if you didn't, you could not, you could not safely preserve your food, right? So it's only a modern thing that everyone's like, oh, I, got, I can't have any salt. Probably people were eating way more salt than we were. But anyway, I digress. If you, Matthew 5, look at verse 13. Matthew 5, this is on the Sermon on the Mount here. Christ is talking to Israel during his earthly ministry, and notice what he says. Speaking to this little flock, he says, Ye are the salt of the earth. Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? Now stop. 
If the salt doesn't affect the taste of the food, what good is it? So I'm putting that in layman's terms, right? If the salt doesn't, if the salt has lost its savor, in other words, the reason you put salt on food is to affect its what? There's two reasons you would put salt on food. One would be to preserve it. We already talked about that. The other one would be to make it taste better. Okay? So Christ is, is saying here, verse, verse 13, And ye, that, ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is therefore good for nothing. So salt that ain't salty anymore is what? Meaningless, right? It's good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the underfoot of men. So he's talking allegorically here about them and to them about how they are the salt of the earth and they shouldn't lose their what? Their savor. They should have the ability and maintain the ability to go out into the earth and have an impact for the truth of the kingdom message to the nation of Israel, right? And he's using this metaphor of talking to them about salt. Go to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, and we want verse 50. Mark chapter 9, verse 50. See, all, all these doctors that tell you salt's bad for you, they're lying to you. You need to listen to the Lord Jesus Christ, verse 50. Salt is good. Okay? Salt is good, but if the salt have lost his saltiness, wherewith will ye season it? Same idea, right? Have salt in who? In other words, they are to be the salt, if you're following the metaphor, right? They are to be the ones that when people encounter them, they're encountering the savor of the Lord. Remember what we read in Ephesians 5 there, where Paul talks about a sweet-smelling what? Savor, okay? Verse 50, salt is good. But if the salt have lost his, his saltiness, wherewith will ye season it? Have salt in yourselves, and have peace one with another. One more on this. Go over to Luke 14. Luke 14. <coughs> Luke chapter 14, verse 35. Again, you know something's important if the Lord says it twice. Verse 34, salt is good. Salt is good, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? Now watch. It is neither fit for the land, nor yet for the dunghill. Cast it out. He that hath ears to hear, let him what? Let him hear. So this issue of salt is an interesting thing to think about. With all that in mind, let's come back now to Colossians 4. This is the only time Paul mentions salt, and it's an interesting use that we need to really think seriously about. Verse 6, Colossians 4, 6, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. Now, I've already mentioned this, but I'll say it again. Historically, salt has had two primary uses. The first one has been as a seasoning to improve the taste of what? Food. And the second is as a preservative, as I mentioned before. Now, Paul, in my opinion, obviously has the first concept in mind here because he specifically mentions that our speech needs to be seasoned with what? Salt. Does that mean you stick your tongue out and sprinkle salt on it before you talk? No. It's, it's to be seasoned with salt. Okay? Now, season. Let's talk about that word season. So I know this later this week, a lot of you ladies, maybe some of you gentlemen are going to be making a turkey, okay? Do you just defrost the turkey, stick it in an oven of some sort, and don't do anything to it? No, why not? It wouldn't taste very good. It'd be gross. So what do you do? You season it. You put rosemary and salt and pepper and butter and all this stuff on it, right? If you're anything like my mom, you get out some scary-looking syringe and you inject it into the turkey, 
and you do all this stuff right, and you put all the seasoning inside, and you get everything just so, right? And then once you have everything just so, and you've seasoned it, and you've buttered it, and you've done what you need to do, then you put it where? Into the oven, right? Why am I bringing this up? Because the word seasoned, when it says there, seasoned with salt, the word seasoned means to prepare in advance or to arrange. To prepare in advance or to arrange in advance with respect to food or to make intentionally set out to make something savory. So in other words, have you given this forethought and planning in advance, right? You've taken the time to sit down and, and, and think about what you're doing and you're going to season it now and you're going to make it just so the way you and your family like it. It's the idea of being prepared or arranged in advance, okay? Now, Paul's using this, this word now, though, to refer to our what? Our speech. He says, verse 6, let your speech be always with grace. That's number one. It's got to be with grace. It's got to edify. That's number one. Number two, it needs to be seasoned with what? Salt. So in my opinion, there are two practical issues in that phrase then for us to consider. There's two practical issues in the phrase season with salt for us to consider, okay? The first, our speech needs to be prepared, arranged, and thought out in advance, okay? You should be in control over what you are saying. You, you should not be just flapping your gums. You need to be seasoned in the way you talk in what you're saying in your speech, myself as well. It needs to be measured. Even when you're seasoning the turkey, did you get the whole can of salt and bump, dump it on? That would be just as bad. Wouldn't it be just as bad to take the whole jar and dump the whole jar on as it would be for there to be no salt on that turkey? Okay? So if you're going to season it, it means it's measured. It means it's moderated. It means it's thought out. It's prepared in advance, right? It's the opposite of being hot and angry. See what I'm saying? If your speech is seasoned with salt, it has a quality of measured restraint to it. You are not running at the mouth with diarrhea of the mouth, yelling and screaming at everybody who's in your way who is not doing what you want them to do. There's a measured, thought-out, prepared, uh, prepared way of doing it, okay? It needs to be your speech. Our speech needs to be intentional. Why? Because we're supposed to be walking in wisdom toward them that are what? Are there a whole bunch of people that don't know Jesus Christ who are listening and watching how you say things? And you need to be more concerned about their eternal salvation and edification than you are your own comfort of the way that you want to say things, okay? So that's number one. Our speech needs to be prepared, arranged, or thought on in advance, measured, <clears throat> and moderated. And then a second thing I think this points out to us, our speech needs to be seasoned, so that's the issue of forethought and preparation, but it needs to be seasoned with what? Salt. In other words, how we're saying and what we're, what we're saying and how we're saying it needs to be palatable. It needs to be palatable to the people that are what? Listening. Okay? So, I think these two things go together. It needs to be palatable to the person hearing it and avoiding the extremes of, number one, blandness. You ever met somebody that says a lot of stuff but doesn't really say anything? Okay, so it's going to be seasoned with salt, right? It needs to be palatable. There needs to be forethought. There needs to be preparation involved in it. It's going to be have that, but it's also going to have this. It's going to be seasoned with salt, so it's it's going to be palatable. It's not going to be it's not going to be bland. It's not going to be dull, but it's also not going to be spicy and over seasoned, where you're hot, mad, and angry and yelling at everybody all the time. There's going to be a studied, measured balance here when we think about the idea of our speech being seasoned with what? With salt. Go, to back, to, go back to Ephesians chapter 4 quick. If 
Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15. In verse 14 he says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive, verse 15, but speaking the truth in what? Listen, if your speech is so bland that you that that nobody ever hears the truth about God's word coming out of your mouth, that's a problem. Okay? But the reverse is also a problem. If you're running so hot with so much fire and spice all the time that you're overwhelming people like dumping the whole jar of salt on the turkey, that's not good either. I mean, I know, I know people, a lot of you, I don't know what you guys would think, but I know people that are what I would call angry preachers. You listen to them, and they just yell and scream and berate and, you know, drive everybody down and into the ground and do all this sort of thing, right? I know I raise my voice and I get excited sometimes, but it's not because I'm mad at anybody, but it's because I'm excited about the Word of God, okay? But you know what I'm saying, right? You've heard this before. So when we think about it being seasoned with salt, it needs to not be bland and dull that there's no truth in it, but it, not, it doesn't need to be so hot and spicy that you're like loading up your doctrine gun and you got like a big bazooka, and every time somebody comes along, you just boom, you just let them have it all the time. Okay? Now you're laughing, and I'm trying to be funny, but there are people I know that are like that. And I'm saying that neither one of those extremes is good. And there's a seasoned moderated middle that's seasoned with salt that does the job that speaks the truth you got to speak the truth but you got to do it how in love verse 15 speaking the truth in love may grow up what we want is growth grow up into him in all things which is the head even Christ so as we think so this is what i'm saying about developing skill Go back to Colossians. Colossians 4, 5, walk in wisdom toward them that are what? Without, verse 6, let your speech be all the way with grace, seasoned with what? See, that walk of wisdom, here's where you practically apply the wisdom. You know somebody. You have a history with somebody. You talk to them in ways that make sense for you to talk to that person, etc., in a way that is seasoned with salt. So look at verse 6. So the next question you should be saying is, well, why should I worry about this? Maybe you think that. Well, you're trying to walk in wisdom in verse 5 toward them that are without, right? But look at what verse 6 says. Verse 6 tells you why. That your speech may be always with grace, seasoned with salt. What's the next word? That. The purpose and the intent. Tells you why. That ye may know how ye ought to answer who? See what I'm saying about the issue of knowledge and wisdom? There they are, both there, right there in those two verses. So why should you be, why should your grace, why should your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt? Verse 6 tells you that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. You understand, um, the way you approach person A may not work with person B. And you might need a different approach for person C. The truth, the same. The truth is the same. The truth never never changes. But you having some wisdom and some skill and some discernment about how to approach different people is what he's talking about when he's talking about walking in wisdom toward them that are without. That ye, the purpose and the intent of it is that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. Now, it's interesting. So that, that, as I said, uh, indicates and identifies the purpose and the intent of what he just said. But the, the word that is rendered answer there in verse 6 means to give, it has the idea of giving a judicial answer or to answer or to respond or to reply to a question or to answer charges. Okay? So if you are walking in wisdom toward them that are without, there's something that should naturally come about as a result of that and that is that people are going to want to know what is different about you. And so you, your speech should be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you, should, that you might know how to answer every man when they come with these questions. 
Come with me to 1 Peter chapter 3. Come over to 1 Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter three, verse is a very famous verse here related to apologetics. Verse fifteen: But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Watch and be ready. How often? Always to give an answer. So there's our word to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and what. Fear. So as a believer, and I know this is Peter writing to the little flock, I got it, you don't need to email me, I understand that issue, okay? I'm, t- I'm talking about the practical application of this, right? Is this still true in a practical sense, that we need to be ready to give an answer, okay? And we need to be ready to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So as you are, as you are questioned, you need to be ready with meekness and in fear or respect, be able to give an answer to that person, having, verse 16, having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you. You understand? You cannot control what they say about you. You cannot control what they say about you. Can you control what you say and how you say it? So we don't need to worry here about things we have no control over. Verse six, Verse 16, <clears throat> having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as, ev- as of evildoers, they, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. See, why? Because you are walking in wisdom toward them that are without. So if they want to make accusation against you that's not true, your conversation and your conduct tell everybody who's watching that that person over there that's evil speaking about you isn't telling what? The truth. It's the issue here. Come over to Philippians chapter 1. We need to be prepared with an answer, folks. And again, that being prepared with an answer implies some forethought, some preparation, some seasoning, if you will. Philippians chapter 1, Paul talks about this issue of giving a defense or giving an answer here. Notice what he says. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 1, verse 7. Even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds. Now watch. And in the defense. That's the same word translated answereth over there in Second Peter. Or First Peter chapter 3, I should say. In the defense and confirmation of the gospel... Ye all are partakers of my grace. Did Paul have to stand and give a defense of what he was preaching? Go read the book of Acts. He does it all the time. Look at verse 17, Philippians chapter 1, verse 17. He says, well, verse 16, For one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense and confirmation of what? The gospel. Was Paul ready to give a defense if he needed to? So take all that with me. Go back to Colossians 4. And let's look at Colossians chapter 4, verse 6. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. Now, as, as I was thinking about this message this week, I was, I was thinking, what would be a good illustration from the Bible to illustrate this concept? And as I was thinking about it, the story of David and Nabal and Abigail came to mind. How many of you know that story? Okay, come with me back to 1 Samuel 25. Come back with me to 1 Samuel chapter 25. There's a story here in the Old Testament where David is on the run, you remember that, you know, David, what, Saul was jealous of David, etc. Um, after David was uh, anointed the next king, and when David slayed Goliath, and uh, everyone was cheering David's exploits uh, over Saul's, etc. And Saul got jealous, and he got upset. And so David, 
is on the run and a bunch of stuff is happening here in the context of 1 Samuel. I want chapter 25. 1 Samuel chapter 25. Now, I don't know if we're going to, we, we will not have time to read every verse here, but we're going to read the highlights of this story, okay? Um, verse 1, and Samuel died. So the prophet Samuel dies. And all the Israelites were gathered together and lamented him and buried him in the house of Ramah. And David arose and went down into the wilderness of Paran. And there was a man in uh, Manan whose possessions were in Carmel. And the man was very great, and he had 3,000 sheep and 3,000 goats, and he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. And the, man, and the name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife Abigail. And she was a woman of good notice, of good understanding, and of beautiful countenance. But the man was Kurdish. That's not good. Was Kurdish. Cruelish, excuse me, and evil in his doings. And he, uh, and, and he was of the house of Caleb. And David heard in the wilderness that Nabal did shear his sheep. And David sent out ten young men. And David said unto the young men, Get ye, get you up to Carmel, and go to Nabal, and greet him in my name. And thus say ye to him that liveth in prosperity, Peace be both upon thee, and peace be to thy house, and peace be unto all that thou hast. So is David in significant need here? Does this guy Nabal have more than he needs? So David's sending his guys to get provision, right? Verse 7, And now I have heard that thou hast shearers. Now thy shepherds, which were with us, we hurt them not. Wherein was there aught missing unto them? All the while they were in Carmel. So here's the understanding that you need to have, okay? Did David and his men have the ability to take these sheep from him without asking? Was it in their power to have taken them? Did David do that? He doesn't do that. So now he's going to send his guys up to ask while they're shearing the sheep if they can have some of what? The sheep. Uh, verse... 8, ask thy young men, and they will show thee. Wherefore, let the young men find favor in thine eyes, for we are come in a good day. Give, I pray thee, whatsoever cometh to thine hand, unto thy servant, and to thy son David. And when David's young men came, they spake to Nabal according to all these words, in the name of David, and ceased. Now watch, verse 10. And Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who is David? And who is the son of Jesse? There may, be, uh, there may be servants nowadays that break away every man from his master. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my flesh that I have killed for my shearers and give it unto men whom I know not whence they be? What's Nabal's reaction? What is his reaction? I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this. So David's young men turned their way and went again and came and told unto him all these sayings. So what's David going to do? Is David going to be like, oh, that's okay. No. And David said unto the men, gird ye on every man his sword. And they girded every man his sword. And David also girded on his sword. And they went up. After David, about 400 men and 200 abode by the stuff. I love that, the stuff, okay? And one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to salute our master, and he railed on them. Was Nabal's speech seasoned with salt? No. Nope. Verse 15, But the men were very good unto us. And we were not hurt, neither missed we anything, as long as we were conversing with them while we were in the fields. They were a wall unto us, both by night and day, and all the while we were with them keeping the sheep. So it turns out, did Nabal benefit from David's men being in this area by helping keep the sheep safe from those who would come and take them? But Nabal's an idiot. Okay, and he's mad. He's like, I'm not going to do this, right? Verse 
uh, 17. Now therefore know and consider what thou wilt do. For evil is determined against our master and against his household. For he is such a son of Belial. Now you fill in the blank what that would mean in modern colloquial American speech. That's what it means. Okay. That a man cannot speak to him. Then Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves and two bottles of wine and five sheep ready dressed and five measures of, of parched corn and a hundred clusters of raisins and 200 cakes of figs and laid them on asses. And she said unto her servants, Go on before me. Behold, I come after you. But she told not her husband Nabal. Why, why do you think she didn't tell him? Because he would have not liked her idea. And it was so, as she rode on the ass, that she came down by the covert of the hill, and behold, David and his men came down against her, and she met them. Now David had said, Surely in vain have I kept all that this fellow hath in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that pertained unto him, and he hath requainted me evil for what? So, did, did David's guys help Nabal maintain his entire herd? Okay? And now Nabal has done evil against him, according to what David is saying here. Verse 22, So, and more also, do God unto the enemies of David, if I leave, if I leave all of that pertain to him, by morning light, any that pisseth against the wall. So in other words, he's going to kill what? Everybody. Okay? And when Abigail saw David, she hastened and lightened off the ass and fell before David on her face and bowed herself to the ground and fell at his feet and said, Upon me, my Lord, upon me let this iniquity be, and let thine, and let thine handmaiden, I pray thee, speak in thine audience and hear the words of thy what? Okay? Now let me ask you a question. In this whole scenario here, who is the one who is... Functioning with grace, whose speech is seasoned with salt. It's Abigail. It's not Nabal. And what Abigail's going to do is she's going to plead the cause of her husband, who doesn't deserve it, right? Verse 25, let not my Lord, I pray thee, regard this man of Belial, even Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Woo. One time for a wife to agree about her husband. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. But I, thine handmaiden, saw not the young men of my Lord, whom thou didst send. Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, seeing the Lord hath withholden thee from coming to shed blood, and from avenging thyself with thine own hand, now let thine enemies and they that seek evil to my Lord be as able. And now this blessing which thine handmaiden hath brought uh, unto my Lord, let it even be given unto the young men that follow my Lord. So what is Abigail basically doing? We could read more, but I think you get the point, right? Is Abigail pleading the case? Guys, don't be an idiot, Nabal, that your wife has to cover for all the time because you're just such a hot-headed ignoramus that you don't have any grace in the way you talk and your speech is never seasoned with what? Salt. Ladies, don't be a busybody going around and involving yourself in everybody else's business. Facebook is great for that, you know that? You know more about what's going on with people than you ever knew, right? It used to be you only knew what was going on in your village. Now you know what's going on everywhere, right? My point is, in bringing this story up, is to give you a practical example of a guy who did whose speech wasn't with grace, it wasn't seasoned with salt, and Abigail goes and does she speak for her husband and get David to change his mind? And was it seasoned? Was it prepared? Was it thought out? She brings all the food. She does all the stuff. And then she gets there and does she say the right thing in the right spirit in the right way to David? And does David back off and change his mind? Now, we, if you read the rest of it, we, which we don't have time to do, 
But if you read down and read to the end of verse 38, Nabal eventually dies. And who ends up marrying Abigail? David. Okay? Go back to Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. I want to say something. Listen, it's not just men that can gum the works up by poor speech. Women can do it too. Okay? Any of us can do it at any time. But notice verse 6 again. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. Did Abigail know what needed to be done? She knew what needed to be done. And did she, did she take the appropriate action to get done what needed to be done? The idea of our speech being seasoned with salt conveys the idea of being prepared in advance for the challenges and questions that people ask regarding the faith. We need to be walking in wisdom, verse 5, toward them that are without, redeeming the time, let your speech be with what your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. And again, the reason for that is are those lost people watching? Are they listening? Are they paying attention? Season with salt that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Don't go there, but write down Titus chapter 2, verse 1, where Paul says, Speak the things that become sound doctrine. My speech, your speech, our speech needs to be done in a way that is becoming of the doctrine that we believe. Okay? It needs to be thought on in advance. It needs to be palatable. It needs to be the right amount of seasoning, not bland, not tasteless, not hot, spicy, and fiery, but palatable. And, and, and in that, that space that is able to answer somebody that comes to you with a what? With a question, according to verse 6. Folks, I don't know about you, but I think about this stuff, and you know, I, I, I read these verses, and I study these verses, and I know that I fall short of this stuff myself so often, okay? My kids do something that makes me mad, and I'm all over them like, you know, something. And I'm in their face, and I'm yelling at them, and I'm upset with them, and, you know, but you know what? I know I'm not any different than you, and we're not any different than each other. But we need to take seriously the fact of our witness to them that are without. And one of the biggest portions of it is our speech and how we talk to each other. And we need to say the right amount at the right time in the right way. And how we say things is just as important as what we say. We need to speak in a way that becomes the doctrine. Lord, thanks for this day and for this time we could spend together in your word. <clears throat> Lord, we're grateful for the remembrance of, of thanksgiving, to set aside time. And we know that as believers that we should be thankful all the time. We should be thankful every day. We should be filled with prayer and supplication with thanksgiving as we make our requests known unto God. Pray that folks will have safe travels, that they'll be have enjoyable times with family and friends, etc. this week. And we pray that we will take seriously the issue of our speech and the issue of our walk toward them that are without. Help us to walk in wisdom. Help us to be able to know how to answer every man. Help us to develop some practical skill in seasoning things appropriately, in making what we say palatable, in making it easily received, and that we will not be getting in our own way by being hot and angry and upset and fiery all the time, but also not going to the other extreme of so dull and tasteless that we have nothing to say when it needs to be said. We're grateful.